Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Regev. I'm a postdoc uh, with uh, the Durbin Group at the University of Cambridge. I'm going to talk about ultra-fast um, inference of pairwise class and stunnings. Okay, so um, first I'm going to talk about what are your coalescence times and why um, do you care about them at all? And um, then in, as a review, I'm going to talk about how to infer them. Um, then I'm going to talk about our work, which is this cool new method we have called gamma SMC, which infers them uh, quickly. And then I'll talk about uh, some applications for that. Okay, so what are coalescence times? Um, all right, so suppose we have um, male and female, and they have an offspring. So each chromosome of the offspring is a mosaic of the two chromosomes of the parent. We know that. Uh, so this means that um, if we look at a specific position at the genome at one chromosome, that it comes from one of the parents, say the mother, um, but because the chromosome is a mosaic, it means that it comes from exactly one of the chromosomes of the mother, so we can um, see which one it is, and this is the red one in this case. We we'll, we'll look at the same position at the other chromosome, the parental one, the paternal one, sorry, um, that we, we see it comes from the blue one, and uh, because of the, it's a mosaic, if we move to another position in the genome, then it could be that the identity of the chromosome changes, so now um, it comes from the green one from the mother, right? Okay, so we can go uh, step back and look at the grandparents, and it turns out that the parents' chromosome and the you know, mosaics of the grandparents' chromosome and so forth, so it's such the, so the offspring's chromosomes are a mosaic of the grandparents. And again, um, if you look at the specific position of one chromosome, we can track it to the parent, but then to the grandparent from which it came. Um, in this case, it's the mom's dad. Um, and again, we can look at the other side and track where that came from. And again, if we look at, at another place in the genome, then, um, for example, the maternal one still comes from the mother, but comes from the other chromosome, but now it comes from the grandparent, from the other grandparent, so the mom's mom in this case. So um, there's, if we continue this uh, you know, to infinity, um, we, we could take a sample, uh, a diploid sample individual, and we could um, you know, write the pedigree of everyone, of all its ancestors, and for each position in the genome, um, going from the mother, there's a chain of ancestors going to the past, um, and the same goes uh, to the dad side, a chain of ancestors going to the past. And the thing is that those two chains of ancestors going um, you know, at the beginning of time, um, they must meet at some point. There's some individual, which is a source, the common source of genetic material that's inherited in um, both chromosomes that this uh, individual has. Um, and this, 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 um, this meeting is called coalescence. It's a coalescence event. And the coalescence time is the number of generations until this coalescence event happens. So it's basically um, the number of generations until the two chains of ancestors meet. And that's a very important statistic. Um, so because chromosomes are mosaics, this means that as we move along the genome, those two chains of ancestors, they shift around and change uh, so that this coalescence time also changes. So here we have um, a simulation that I did. Um, so x-axis is the genome, genomic position. The y-axis is the coalescence time. And you can see that um, it, as we move along the genome, uh, we can think about it as some hidden state that changes. Not every base pair, but in, in chunks. This has to do with where recombinations are. Okay. So now we know what coalescence times are, but why do we care about them at all? Um, so it turns out this, the coalescence times are very useful. It's a rich source of information from which we can make a lot of inferences, um, um, pop gen inferences, if you're into this kind of thing. Um, so, so the first, I'm gonna give you a few examples. Um, so um, the first paper to kind of do it, come up with a method to do this was the Lee and Durbin, uh, 2011, and they use this for population size history, so demography inference. Just, so this is here. So tracking the population size history of a sample um, back in the past, and this was generalized to several populations to detect migration rates between them. Um, this can be used to detect selection. I'm going to talk about that um, a little bit. Um, and then if you think about it for more than one sample, for example, if many samples and you do, and you have the coalescence times for every pair of them, then you can use that to build the thing called an ARG, which is a sequence of gene genealogical trees along these multi-chromosomal uh, samples. 
um, that is very useful. Um, and this is further used to detect population structure for imputation. Uh, this was used to uh, do rare variant association studies, et cetera. And there are many more ideas, uh, a lot of them not yet explored. Uh, but the point I'm trying to make is that this is a very useful thing to have. Um, and specifically, um, because we know what to do it on large scale samples nowadays, uh, it will be extra useful to be able to do that really, really quickly, which is the goal of our work. Okay, so um, before describing how to do this quickly, I'm gonna have to describe how to do this at all. So um, the key insight as to how to do this is this. Um, so imagine, for example, the diploid, a single diploid, and suppose that you uh, magically know where the recombination points are. Um, then, if you have a segment that's inherited in full from um, in both sides from common ancestor, then if if there was a recent coalescence time, so not a lot of generations in the coalescence, then if you compare the two sequences from the mother and the father, they will be uh, quite similar because the only reason for them to be different if there were any mutations along the way, and because the, it's recent coalescence time, not many generations, there weren't a lot of chances for mutations to happen. So recent coalescence time means fewer mutations between the two sides of the diploid, okay? Um, and then if you have a segment with an old coalescence time, then there are many more chances for mutations to happen. So this means that um, there will be more differences between the two sides of the diploid. So this um, should give you the intuition that the local density of heterozygosity, um, or the differences between the two chromosomes of the diploid, is, uh, it reflects the coalescence times. Um, but unfortunately, we don't know where the combination points are because, you know, no one tells us that, so we are, uh, we, are um, we have to resort to statistics and algorithms and stuff. Okay, so, um, so the method to do that, the first one to do this uh, was this PSMC method, Perwa sequentially Markovian coalescence, a bit of mouthful. Um, so the way it does that is to, uh, it models the coalescence time along the genome as an HMM, and um, where the, the hidden state is this, the coalescence time, and the observations are the sequence, or rather um, a disposition in the sequence, whether it's homozygous or heterozygous. Uh, and the mutations in the sequence provide the evidence for coalescence times. And uh, this is a particular form of the, mat of the transition and emission matrices, I'm not gonna go into that, but it's, it's, it follows from coalescent theory. Um, and then the standard forward backward algorithms is used to infer coalescence time. We're gonna briefly um, remind you how this works. So the forward algorithm uh, goes on the genome um, from beginning to end, and at each point it tracks the uncertainty of the coalescence time at position N, given or conditional on the sequence up until that position. So it tracks that and propagates that as it goes forward. And the backward algorithm does the same, except uh, conditional on all the suffix, all, 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 the, all the sequence um, from that point forwards. And then the forward-backward algorithm um, does both of those passes and combines them together to give a full posterior distribution of the constant time at position given the full sequence. So this is how it works. Um, so this is very nice. Um, so what's the problem with that? The problem is that we want to make it faster. And um, one way to, <coughs> to, to do that is to consider that um, well, coalescence time is, well, time is uh, kind of like a continuous thing, right? But HMMs, they deal with matrices and vectors and stuff like that, so they don't like continuous stuff. It's not very easy to deal with that, so. Um, what methods have been doing so, so far is to take time and discretize that into T intervals, T being like 32 or something, and then work in those quantized um, discrete intervals. And uh, so from PSMC, going forwards, there's been a series of methods that have tried to make this faster and faster, and they've been quite successful. But uh, no matter what you do, as long as you have this T vector per position, um, you'll be linear in T um, per base pair or per, per you know, hat or something like that. So we thought maybe we can drop this T by doing something else which is where our method comes from, okay. So gamma SMC, this is the core of the method. I'm not gonna go into all the details, but I'm happy to discuss later. Um, so the 
core idea here is, is instead of holding these T numbers uh, for the conditional distribution of the coalescence time given a prefix or a suffix, then we assume that this distribution is a gamma. And here on the right, it's a bunch of gammas. This is how they look. It's a family of uh, distributions that's um, defined by two parameters, alpha and beta. And it's quite nice. You can have many shapes. And uh, gamma is a good thing to have. Why? First of all, because instead of holding these T numbers, all we have to do is hold just two numbers. Uh, so now we drop some O of T to a constant time per site. Uh, but also gamma is a good choice for that because gamma, first of all, it tracks quite well and um, it's conjugate to Poisson. Okay, so um, now the problem is that we can't really um, use the HMM as it is. We have to replace it with update rules. I'm not gonna go into that. Um, but we did all of that stuff. We wrote it in efficient code with some smart caching and vectorizing operation and so forth. So we have this method. And so the preprint is out. It's in BioArchive, you can read it. And also have a, have a GitHub repo which you can use. And this is designed to be um, really lightweight. So basically all you need to do is give it a VCF of your cho choice and, and then a reasonable estimate of your recombination to mutation rate ratio of your species. Um, and it'll run quickly and give you the results. Okay, so um, gamma SMC is much faster than uh, alternatives. Um, so set of the art is this ASMC method, that which is it's quite good, it's quite fast, it's seconds per genome, but our method is 0 0.1 something seconds per genome. So it's really quick, fast. And also, um, it's quite accurate. So if you compare to alternative, it's slightly less accurate, but still it's the same ballpark, so we think it's still very useful for inference. Um, and, and this is the kind of output that you get from it. Um, so this is a one position in the genome. I, I, so this is um, 500 individ individuals of European ancestry from 1,000 genome projects. So this is one position in the genome. And this is the <coughs> uh, coalescence time inferred between each one, each pair of these. So. This is what you get. It's a nice, well, rectangle in this case. So it should be a square. Um, then you can have a lot of information. There's a lot to say about that. Um, and here's a bunch of more examples of how this looks. And now the question is that, okay, so now we have that. It's run really quickly. It gives us all these nice matrices. What can we do this? I'm gonna um, really quickly go through two applications. First is detective selection. This has been done before, but it's a nice uh, sanity check. So, um, so if, if there's been recent selection, then it means that uh, alleles pro propagated really quickly, so it means that going backwards in time, the coalescences will be very recent, so um, compared to neutral estimation uh, and expectation. So if you look at this, this LCT region, which is known to be strongly selected, you can see that it's ex extremely enriched for recent selection. Um, so this can be a basis for selection scan, and indeed we can do that. For example, we can ask um, how much of the posterior density um, across all pairs is below some threshold, and we can see the LCT pops up as expected, and a few, bunch of other stuff. So this is one natural th way to think about selection in this case. And then a new thing that we're working on um, is this inversion stuff. It's a work in progress, but it's nice and promising because it turns out that once you have these statistics, all these applications start to pop up. So um, this is I stole this from uh, my colleague Moritz, who's working with his fishes. This is a picture of him in, in Africa um, doing fun stuff while I was coding in C++. Um, so the thing about these fish is that um, they're a good example of adaptive radiation, but uh, specifically here um, we care about the fact that they have chromosomal inversions. And uh, the thing about chromosomal inversions is that we want to detect them. No one tells us that they are there. But um, if you have uh, inversion that there's a pressure combination between them. So basically, uh, once you have an inversion, then you can recombine in that region. So what we did is we ran gamma SMC on these 50 fish. So this is now just pairwise within individuals, so not, be not between them because phasing is not very good. And so you have three types of fish. One is um, just a homozygous state, one homozygous with inversion, one is heterozygous, one, one chromosome inverted, one not. And you can see that so the, inver the het is the is the orange one, and you can see that the average coalescence time is higher than the other ones. And the reason for that is you can see that here in this, in this uh, drawing is that if you have one chromosome that's, was, that's with an inversion 
and one without an inversion, that this means that they must coalesce um, before the inversion arose in the population. And if you have um, something that's the green one, so it's uh, homozygous to the inversion, that this means that the two chromosomes must coalesce after the inversion arose. So this gives a kind of like a sharp distinction between them, so that even after inference uncertainty, you can still see a very clear signal of that. So we are ho working on that. Hopefully this will be a good method that's um, um, good to work on. And I'm gonna skip that and uh, summarize my talk. Um, so, summary is this. Um, Coalescence times are a, a very rich source of information for which we can do many things. A, so gamma SMC is our new method that's just out. Um, it's very fast for inferring these coalescence times. Um, because it's so fast, it can run on pairwise on tens of thousands of samples, maybe even more. And we're now, and just now, entering uh, a phase where we're trying to, all these nice applications pop up where it's useful, we're talking about selection and, and demography inference and inversions, but we also have thoughts about population structure and polygenic selection and local answer inference and regression. I'm, I'm really um, happy to hear any more suggestions because I think it could be very useful across the um, domain. All right, so with that, I'd like to thank um, my founders and the university and um, the Durban group, which is a really nice group. Richard, my advisor, Trevor, Elwin, and Moritz, and you for listening. Thanks.